All right, that's, that's, that'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I was born in... Uh, Thank you about 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and my dad was a fine artist, I mean in the hyphenated sense of the word. Uh, he was primarily a painter, but he was also an art teacher at a college level institution, sort of a municipally funded art school basically, it did nothing but just teaching art. And so um, that meant that we uh, didn't have much money, uh, <laughs> starving artists and all of that. And uh, so I grew up in a, I guess you could say, lower middle class, very modest neighborhood, went to public school, same school, by the way, from the first grade to the 12th. Uh, I, I graduated from high school in 1959. So that sort of formative period was very much, you know, it's sort of, as I like to say, I didn't listen with my ears so much as your breastbone. It sort of, you know, enters you in a subliminal way at that age. You just sort of absorb it. And uh, uh, that was, I think, pro I mean, as, so, as it is for so many people, uh, those formative years really set the course for the rest of my uh, career because or my life because it was a sense that really big changes are taking place you wanted to sort of be on the cutting edge of that on the leading leading wave and uh, one of the 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 main the things that dominated really the 1960s were the uh, 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 the environmental movement, okay. uh, the anti-war movement, and the civil rights movement. And so I was really more involved in the 1960s. I went to graduate school uh, in beginning in 1963 and at Syracuse University. And uh, when I returned to Memphis in 1966, um, I started, uh, my first job was at the University of Memphis, Memphis State University, and it had recently integrated, and, and I was asked by the handful of black students that had uh, matriculated there to be, to be the advisor of their black students association. There were no African American faculty members, and so I became very involved in the Southern Civil Rights Movement uh, from about 1966 until I left Memphis in 1968. Wow, in Memphis. In Memphis, right. I was there during Martin Luther King's last campaign wow. and I was coordinating college campus activities with his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so yeah, that was a... You were in the midst of it. I was in the midst of it, and it was one of the most transformative and also personally wounding events in my life. I mean, I, I'm about to break down now. I still can't remember those days without a sense of real personal loss, you know, so... Personal loss? Yeah, because in my opinion, Martin Luther King was the, our greatest moral leader of the 20th century. And so you think about what we lost with that, with that assassination. Yeah, it was, it was, it felt and still feels to me very, you know, uh, very sad. Yeah. So anyway, that that was the the background to what we really want to talk about here, and that's you know the emergence of environmental philosophy. I guess. So. People who were founders of the field of environmental philosophy was that 
they they had sort of romance with the woods or the wilderness or something like that. They were they were emotionally and uh, uh, experiential, experientially involved in the natural environment. For me, it, it, my interest in environmental philosophy came directly out of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Really? Yes. Okay. Because as a philosopher, the 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 the, the basic philosophy of the Southern Civil Rights Movement was really 18th century enlightenment. I mean, human universalism, human rights, human dignity, all of those things. And so in Memphis, I realized that I was just a foot soldier in Martin Luther King's, you know, civil rights movement. And I wasn't contributing anything unique that I could bring to it as an intellectual, as a philosopher. Wow. And looking around at what's going on in, at that particular time, it occurred to me that while the thinking behind civil rights, not fully, but I mean there was a lot to, to do around the edges, but the core of the thinking had been accomplished in the 18th century essentially, nobody was thinking about our human relationship with nature. That was completely unprecedented in the history of Western philosophy, with a very few exceptions, and so here was an, here was a real challenge, a real ethical challenge, not so much at the social and political level, not to diminish the challenge of the civil rights movement at the social and political level, but at the philosophical uh, uh, level. And so I had already begun to think about this before I left Memphis. And then, as a result of um, my participation in the civil rights movement and uh, being, uh, being involved in a lot of other things that young people are involved in that um, can get you in trouble if you're not careful, uh, I lost my job in, at the University of Memphis and uh, landed, fortunately, at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. So, but before I was, I got there, I had been already thinking. Well, you know, where the real intellectual challenge here is, is in the environmental movement, not the civil rights movement, not the anti-war movement. I mean, the war is going to be over one way or the other. Civil rights was now a matter of a battle in the streets, in the courts. In, in the, in, in, in the, in, in the uh, political uh, and social arena, but not in the intellectual arena. And so that's the, the environment offered the, the biggest uh, challenge to, to think at a fundamental level about the age-old questions of philosophy. What is nature? what's human nature, and what's the appropriate relationship. Intellectually un, unexplored territory. And so you, you begin to push those boundaries and you find that they, the, 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 the problems are bigger than you thought. Uh, you're now in dialogue with other people who have different conceptions of this, so certain uh, arguments internal to the field begin to develop. Uh, various positions start gradually to articulate themselves. I became identified with a certain uh, a certain uh, focus in the field which I wanted to sustain as the field develops so that it doesn't just sort of come and then gets overwhelmed and forgotten and moved on. Already, I've already expressed a little bit of this in our uh, public dialogue 
as a result of the first edition of Purlieu. Um, one of the things that was an opportunity for me in that, that environmental philosophy presented was to do, as I like to sometimes put it in an overly dramatic way, to do philosophy like a pre-Socratic, to paint with a broad brush. Because what environmental philosophy uh, raised were the, the most fundamental and in some sense the first issues or questions that Western philosophy begins with. Pre-Socratic philosophy begins with natural philosophy. And so ecology and the other sciences are, uh, and, the, and the second scientific revolution of the early 20th century, not just in ecology, but in, in physics and so on, uh, opens up these same questions that the pre-Socratic philosophers were, were dealing with. And so it enabled me to do philosophy, well, not just like a pre-Socratic, but in the grand tradition of philosophy, which, has, which had been abandoned, for the most part, by 20th century philosophy. So in 20th century philosophy, it presented you with the, with the alternatives that I was criticizing in my conversation uh, about Zabala's uh, essay in, in your journal, and that is you had a choice between analytic philosophy or phenomenology, continental philosophy, and that was basically it, where 20th century academic philosophy was concerned. Well, Zabala basically was saying, this is the way I make fun of it, there's a radio station in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, that advertises it, they say, we play both kinds of music, country and western. Uh, so, <laughs> in any university, or in the whole of, let's say, American and Euro European universities are just like this radio station. We play both kinds of philosophy, phenomenology, and analytic philosophy, as if there's no other. You know, that's what pissed me off. That's what got me, <laughs> got me going. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> there's more to it than continental philosophy and analytic philosophy. There are other things that are starting to emerge that really represent the future of philosophy. And, and it's not just this I mean, that's so 20th century, you know, these two choices. And here we are more than a decade into the 21st century, not just the 21st century, but the third millennium. And philosophy has always measured its history, calibrated its history in terms of centuries. 19th century philosophy, 17th, 6th, 4th centuries BC, and so on. And as I like to say, the 20th century is over. You know, it's a historical period now. Analytic philosophy and phenomenology are part of the history of philosophy. Uh, and the real question is, what is philosophy today? What is, where, where, where is it and where is it headed and where is it going?